You love Jack Pfeffer stories, right? Yeah, you know what? It's so funny. Right before we went to air, you mentioned something about Jack Pfeffer, and he's been on my mind because I just ran into something in my files on him. So, yeah. Well, and I, I talked, folks, to my good friend of the Fantastics, Bobby Fulton, who's made some other news lately, and we'll talk about that in a second. But for the purpose of this story, because this was Christmas week before this other development happened. And we obviously, we just tell old wrestling stories because we're old wrestling fans. And Bobby used to live outside of Charlotte in Kannapolis, North Carolina, and that was right down the road from China Grove, North Carolina, which is where Jackie Fargo had retired to. He was originally from the Carolinas, and that's where he had his his business, his place of business, as he used to call it, which was his gambling establishment not necessarily open to the general public, but everybody that needed to know knew. But anyway, so Bobby spent a lot of time with Fargo to hear old wrestling stories because we've talked about him many times on the program here, the fabulous Fargo's Jackie and Don main evented Madison Square Garden sold out against Rocca and Perez in the 50s and were the huge tag team stars of Tennessee that led to be getting over so strong led to the fabulous ones Lane and Kern being created in the 80s and their promoter and manager legitimately for a period of time because Jackie Fargo popped up a lot of places as the world champion where Jack Pfeffer would go in but the Fargos were managed and promoted by Jack Pfeffer around the country for some time and occasionally they would travel with him and Jackie would tell the stories of having to, and for the folks briefly who don't know, Jack Pfeffer was a, a pioneer wrestling promoter. He had first worked as a younger man when he came over from Russia or wherever he had worked in the Russian ballet as a young man. Right. And in, in some, in the promotional end of it. Right. And then it came over and got affiliated with the early wrestling promoters, but he was a, oddball character he was responsible for one of the big exposés of the business in new york in the 30s when he felt like he was cut out and cheated by the other members of the trust and that was a he was a powerful figure in wrestling for decades either by being able to get into a successful operation and get guys over and get them loyal to him, or by then, in unhappier times, as they used to say, going to different successful promoters and threatening to expose their business like he had before and kill it unless they booked his talent or did whatever he wanted. So anyway, so Fargo's telling Bobby that Pfeffer who was what, you know, not even five and a half feet tall, and people have described him in writing as looking like a crow. And he had the, at this point, the late 50s, the graying hair and the big nose and the kind of bad teeth. And you always see pictures of him. He's wearing a suit, but it's a suit from like the 30s or 40s, the like gangster movies. And because that he wore one suit. They said it never washed it, never laundered it, never dry cleaned it. Day after day, and he had the cigars, so it had the cigar burns and the ashes all over it. And they said, <laughs> Fargo said, I've never heard this reported in any other historical publication. Fargo told Bobby that Pfeffer had some kind of big either growth or maybe it could have been a hernia down near his groin. <laughs> I never heard that before. I'd never either. But you would look at the guy and think anything's possible. And that combined with the fact that he wore the same suit every day and whatever the fuck, he had piss stains in the in the lap of his his suit. And it's got his, you know, meal dribblings. And he you've heard the story about the fingernail. He would keep one of his little pinky finger nails grown long and sharpened, and that was his nose-picking finger. And they said you would sit there and watch it like he was a big, he would go into, you know, delis or stores or, you know, lunch counters or whatever, and he'd get things like he'd make a sandwich 
out of, he'd buy the bread and buy the bologna and in the back seat he'd spread it all out in his fucking lap with the cigar burns and the ashes and the piss stains and he'd make a fucking bologna sandwich and he'd say here Jakey because it was Jakey and Danny here Jakey you got, you want a sandwich you got to keep up your strength no okay or he'd have a jar of them dill pickles and he'd take his nose picking pinky nail and he'd stick it in a jar and pull out a fucking pickle he'd say you want a pickle and they traveled with this fuck, but he got them booked everywhere because so many promoters were scared to not just go along with Pfeffer and also the Fargo's a great team they came off sellouts in Madison Square Garden but he'd do all these publicity posters on his guys and blanket you know territories you've seen a bunch of the old ones and it was like I own a bunch like of the old if, ones if, yeah. if Bob Luce if Bob Luce had good grammar right? Then it would be a Jack Pepper promotion. They are sensational. You can hear it in his voice, right? But just off a sellout in Madison Square Garden. But anyway, Jack Pepper. The other day I was going through the files and some of the stuff in the Pfeffer file that I just loved. The Pfeffer file? The Pfeffer file. It was stuff that he had given to Ring. to uh, Before it was the Ring's wrestling one, it was just the Ring magazine before they even had the wrestling offshoot. And it's all in his handwriting. So it's pictures of him with Ray Steele, him with Jim Londis. You talk about him in New York in the 30s, Jack Hurley, Rudy Miller, him. That was the height of New York for many, many yeah. years, that period of time. Well, yeah, when, when they closed him out, he made sure of it. He killed it for yeah. almost 15 years. For a long time, that's right. I mean, what was it? Gorgeous George and Vern Gagne couldn't do anything in the garden. It was, it was dark for 12 years from 39 to 51. But there's also pictures of him. And he, it's in his handwriting. He claimed one of them was 1950. There's no way. <laughs> and it's when he's an old man and he claims he was the original Beatle. Because he has a Beatle oh, haircut. Yeah, and he claims <laughs> that he invented the Beatle. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that picture. That was the old, he was so cheap. And that was in the old days, the, the bowl haircut. They did it with kids. They, uh, your mom would just turn a fucking mixing bowl over your head and just trim all around the fucking edges. It and has that, his notes like, see, original Beatle. Beatle, 1950 in locker room. <laughs> <laughs> well, because that, he was a publicity genius. He would, you know, figure out everybody had a gimmick. And remember, he's the one that obviously we've talked about for you listeners that did the rip off names instead of Bobo Brazil was Hobo Brazil, Bruno San Martino, Bummy Rogers. If he didn't have anybody with a budget behind him, he would go and he would promote complete fakes. And then when he'd find somebody that had a budget, he would do the opposite. He'd promote the real thing. It just so happened he was in wrestling because he is the classic old school New York entertainment hustler. He lived in the hotel. You know what I mean? Like that was his life. Yes, from hotel to hotel and on the road with either the guys. And you see all the letters that are... Re Tim Hornbaker's got a bunch of them. He's got the Patreon. Everybody should check out. But you know, the letters from guys, wrestlers across the country, reporting into him on how they're doing in the territory he got them booked in and or sending him, you know, 10% of the, you know, their money is the booking fee or whatever. And thank you, Jack. This is, you know, a great job, a great spot you got for me or whatever. But I remember there's one, was it a story in whatever happened to Gorgeous George or it's around there that Pfeffer at one point, because he's got the accent. And in those days, before email, obviously, or even before fax machines or, you know, copiers readily available or whatever, wrestling promoters would call the cards to a local promoter or to get posters printed or whatever they'd call them in. And that's why a lot of times on these old newspaper ads, you see such ridiculous spellings, right? Of the guy's names. And Pfeffer calls this guy a local promoter in some town. He's like, this week I got for you a brand new sensation, like Ivan Vladimakov. And the guy, well, how do you spell that? And he's like, uh, V-A-L, uh, V-L-A-D, uh, ah, fuck it, don't book him. He just makes shit up as he went along. Vilma Snyder. V Vilma, Vilma Snyder. You think you're getting Wilma Snyder? All of a sudden, Vilma Snyder's there. <laughs> yeah. 
But anyway, so that's a, a Jack Pfeffer story from Jackie Fargo by way of Bobby Fulton. But 